Michelle Prince, founder and CEO of Performance Publishing Group, making a difference one story at a time. We'll be shining the light on successful founders, entrepreneurs, business owners, and leaders that are getting results and making a difference. We'll talk about how they built their businesses, are creating movements, and leveraging the power of authority in their own lives. Be sure to stick around to the end of the show and we'll reveal how you can be our next guest. Let's get started. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Power of Authority Spotlight, where we shine the light on outstanding business owners, founders, leaders, entrepreneurs, people that are doing incredible things with their business, but they have a bigger impact behind it, and they're leaving a trail of making a difference. And this person that we're going to be talking to today is absolutely one of my favorite people, and I haven't had an opportunity to talk with him in such a long time, so this is a little bit of a reunion for me as well. But first, let, this episode is brought to you by Performance Publishing. Performance Publishing provides done-for-you publishing services for soon-to-be authors. Have you ever thought about writing a book? Has anyone ever said you should write a book? Well, everyone has a story. Every story matters. So go to performancepublishinggroup.com, grab a free strategy call, start down the path of becoming an author right away. That's performancepublishinggroup.com. Well, let me introduce you to my friend, Dr. Joey Fawcett. He is a positive culture architect, executive coach, and best-selling author of numerous books, including his latest Small Hinges, Swing Big Doors. Awesome title. He enjoys individuals and companies to attract top, or he empowers, I'm sorry, he enjoys them too, but he does empower. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I do. He empowers individuals and companies to attract top talent, reduce team turnover, and develop people, productivity, and profits. He hosts the Work Positive podcast weekly, and as a prolific writer of over a thousand articles, his content has appeared on the websites of Fox News. CNBC, Wall Street Journal, Market Watch, MSNBC, Entrepreneur.com, and countless others in more than 50 countries. Welcome to the show, Dr. Joey. Michelle, my day is made by being with you again, my dear. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I absolutely love this. And you know what? You <clears throat> have not actually talked in years. And we, we were just kind of reminiscing before the show started that I met you initially, it was either 2009 or 2010, and our dear friend, uh, Jim Palmer, connected us. And a big shout out to Jim. He is big shout out. He is just he's also one of my favorite people and uh, my big brother, as we have said to each other. Um, and <laughs> I'm so excited he connected us back. Oh, in me the day. too. Me too. Uh, but, you know, and, and, and recently we reconnected through our friend Tom Schwab. And, mm -hmm. and so I always say that like attracts like, and you, you tend to mm. gravitate toward people that are similar. And you and I have always uh, had that uh, bond. And I'm so excited to be yes. here. I am delighted to be with you today. Thank you so much, Michelle. Of course. Well, and I am excited to have you on the show because you have done so much through the years in terms of um, you know, helping other companies and individuals to be the best that they can be, but you, you know, mm -hmm. building your own business. I know a lot of the listeners can really relate to um, some of your journey. And so can we just start there telling us, you know, a little bit more about what workpositive.today is. And then, mm -hmm. but, but I always like to also to ask the backstory <clears throat> of, well, how did you get there? So let's start with what you do and then back from there. Okay. All right. Well, basically, I coach companies to grow people and profits through a positive work culture. When you grow people, your profits grow. Um, if you become myopic and focus just on the profits, then that tends to encourage a set of behaviors that are, I won't say anti-people, but maybe people agnostic. Um, so it's the people uh, on both sides of the table who really bring you the profits. And those are your customers or clients, as well as your team members and people who with whom you're working to deliver whatever product or service you're doing or create it. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, and man, we work in so many different industries. Um, we're recording this at the end, towards the end of 2023. So I was taking a look back and a snapshot of, as, as we all do, who are my primary clients? You know, where's the money coming from? What industries, things like that. And we do seem to have settled into <clears throat> kind of a niche in financial services whether it's banks or mortgage companies or insurance companies, things like that through the years, that's been the big consistent thread for us. But I never set out to say, Hey, we're going to specialize in financial services. It is kind of like where, where things took us. But 
the the culture piece is huge today. <clears throat> We're I I think the pandemic, at least in my interpretation of the pandemic, the, the quick and dirty interpretation is it really uh, put a spotlight to use your metaphor <laughs> on who are the people that are doing the work and where do they best do the work and how do they best do the work and then. The realization came that we've got at least four generations in a lot of companies now. My friend Marisa Andrada, who was CHRO at Chipotle and Starbucks, says that she actually worked with a company that had five gins. And I, I just can't even begin to imagine. <laughs> that blows the top off my head. I used to say it took the hair off my head, but I didn't say that <laughs> when we first met, I could have said that, right? <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, the, the generational distinctions from my generation of boomers and millennials and Zs and then the true digital natives who are maybe a little early for the workforce now, but are, are coming into the workforce certainly within the next few years, the distinctions between them are huge. So we've just begun, I think we've been, our hands been called on how do we best grow people mm -hmm. who will grow our profits. Mm -hmm. and primarily looking internally at our teams, understanding that when we take care of our teams in the best way possible and create a positive work culture, then our customers, as you said earlier, are going to be attracted to us. So that's where Work Positive uh, today uh, emerged was from this realization. But it goes back further to like 2011. And because you help people become authors, um, I'll just give a shout out to you and the work that you do. And if not, don't wait for somebody to tell you you should have written a book or you ought to write a book. Just go ahead and say, I'm going to write a book and then call Michelle to help you. <laughs> um, I've, I've sent, I don't even know how many people to you. Uh, I got tired of, of just saying to you, hey, I sent this person to you because they, they, they wanted to write a book, they needed to write a book. And so I sent them to you. But in, in uh, and I had written books before 2011, but Entrepreneur Magazine uh, published Work Positive in a Negative World in 2011. Morgan James Publishing, David Hancock, my good friend, uh, published the team edition of that book in 2020. Both of those books grew out of the Great Recession back from 07, 08, back up in there, when business dried up, went away, blew away. <laughs> and my wife looks at me and says, uh, honey, isn't it time for you to travel? And I'm like, mm, cash cow, I was riding, got slaughtered, and, and, and it was only hamburger. <laughs> no Good old days. Lays in that cow. So uh, anyway, I, I went back into the Great Depression when that was an economic instead of just a medical term and discovered some core practices, five, in fact, core practices that entrepreneurs uh, who became business owners had plowed into their businesses or actually created their businesses. Think of it as the DNA of these Great Depression gurus. So you're talking about companies like HP was invented during the Great Depression. Uh, George Mahurl actually started State Farm in 1922. So that was ahead of the Great Depression. But he, it, his focus was on farmers and, and their equipment. And so, you know, what happened to all the farms in the Great Depression, but he kept the company going, and now they got about 19,000 agents around the, around the U.S. now. Um, Harlan Sanders. You know, I, I was in Kentucky recently and went by Corbin, uh, oh. where, <laughs> where those 11 secret herbs and spices came up. I mean, that dude was 66 in the middle of the Great Depression, which, of course, back in the 20s and 30s was ancient. Right. And he, he rode around with a station wagon and a few chicken legs and thighs and 11 secret herbs and spices on a pressure cooker and taught people how to make chicken his way. I mean, how did he do that? What did he do? So I just studied, uh, Dale Carnegie's another, just studied all these people. What is it they did? Okay, how can I do what they did? And that's where the five core practices of a work positive framework for this positive culture came from. And it still works today and continues to work today. So just helping companies integrate that into their own DNA once they recognize, hey, our people are, are who are getting the job done here. 
I absolutely love this topic too, because I also have a passion for leadership development and people development. And uh, I, I'm curious, so what are these four, five core practices? Can I put you on well, the thank, Thanks for asking, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to run through them quickly. Uh, all five of them name, they, they rhyme. When I name them, you'll hear them. So when I'm standing on a platform, uh, in front of 1,200 people, I can remember them, or when I'm talking on a podcast. So the first, uh, of course, being a Zig Ziglar, uh, you, you met Zig when you were a teen, I think, and, and went on to work with him. So you would know what the first one is. I call it the perceived core practice, and it's all about the mental dynamic of a positive work culture. And, and that's the attitude, you know, Zig talked all the time about stinking thinking and how you get rid of stinking thinking. So uh, there's just some core practice, that core practice is built around that kind of understanding that you can focus on the positive and filter out the negative. Because oftentimes, you know, all the way back to 1952, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale's Power of Positive Thinking book. My favorite. Yeah, <laughs> I know, mine too. Uh, but, but so often that positive thinking uh, today gets sacrificed on the altar of realism or reality, right? You can't just think positively and suddenly, you know, play basketball like Le LeBron. Right. Um, I tried it with Mike. I wanted to be like Mike, but anyway, it didn't <laughs> quite work out. But but focusing on the positive and filtering out the negative, you know, these are not some Jedi ninja mind tricks you pull on yourself. It's simply taking captive every thought, right? And making sure that it's focused on positive dynamics within your business and then filtering out the negative because what you think about does become reality so anyway i i spent a little too much time on that one but uh, yeah. a good one it's the best one to start with yeah with you and in, in your background with zig so the second one is the conceive core practice and that's all about relationships mm -hmm. um, and it's both within and without of your company whether you're talking about customers and clients vendors suppliers or team members and this is focusing on positive people and filtering out those people that I refer to as Eeyore vampires. Mm. Eeyore because nothing will ever work. Vampires because these people go home with you and after, in the back of your mind and after dark when you're trying to have fun, like I'm, I'm having fun being a pops, right? And uh, you, you're, you're putting together blocks, Lego blocks in the living room floor with your granddaughter or with your son. You know, that year of vampires sucking your time, energy, and attention away. And that's tragic. So it's perceived mentally, conceived socially. The third dynamic is believe. And this is emotional. And this is the place where engagement takes place with your work and in your work. Uh, Gallup's last poll found that 85%, this is the highest number ever, 85% of American workers are disengaged at work. Now, that's a huge loss of innovation and creativity that can be our competitive advantage on a global market now. But when you lose that, you know, you're losing all your human resources are gone, right? When 85% are disengaged. So how do we help people engage emotionally with their work? I think just quickly, I think we're going through a great redefinition of work right now to where we are understanding that work is not an, is not best done with an assembly line mentality but instead discovering people the human so we're putting the human back in the resources and we're redefining work and the satisfaction the meaning the alignment of purpose i talk a lot about belonging and becoming uh, as a part of the work journey uh, when companies do that, then top talent attraction is locked and loaded. Oh, yeah. So we perceive it mentally, conceive it socially, believe it emotionally. The fourth is, and I know this is a topic near and dear to your heart also, is the achieve or practice. And that's the physical action that one must take as a part of work. So here, productivity, and I know that's something you've written a lot about, productivity mm -hmm. is wrapped up in, in that uh, Perry Marshall, one of my mentors, talks about the 80-20 rule a lot. And so how do we spend in, you know, the 20% the of, how do we focus on the 20%? Of course, the challenge there is you keep going for 20% and then you find the 20%, 80% of that 20% is extraneous. So 
but but it's just a again redefining work to what are those strategic actions mm. so it's really a focus on behavior and tactics within company culture that make a huge difference and how do we show up every day for work and how do we roll around here being a good southerner you know how do y'all roll uh <laughs> that's always a question i ask so the fifth and final one i perceive it mentally conceive it socially believe it emotionally achieve it physically the fifth one really surprised me michelle I just didn't see it coming because after you achieve it, you know, you got the results you were after. As my friend Jody Thompson would say, you've got a row results only work environment, right? So what else is there? The ethical dynamic of now, what do I do with my results is huge. And this was what keep this is what I discovered keeps the whole cycle turning. And I refer to this as the receive core practice. And it's that ethical dynamic, just a recognition that my customers keep the lights on. My team members are the ones who are doing the, the lion's share of the work here. How do I say thank you? How do I express my gratitude to them? How do I serve them? And so I, as an executive coach, I work with a ton of entrepreneurs who are, who are now business owners. And that's the big pivotal question. That's the one that really opens up and accelerates your business is asking your people, how can I best serve you? And when you do that and, and give tangible expression, both in your community and within your company to that gratitude, it just lifts the whole thing. And it's amazing how just appreciating people yeah. makes a, makes a huge difference and expressing that appreciation to them. And of course, there's there's book gift giftology. There's uh, uh, love languages. Got Gary Chapman's written one on the love languages of appreciation and yes. things like that. So there are lots of resources for that too. So those are the five core practices. Thanks for asking. And that last word was relieve. Did I get that right? Receive. Oh, receive. I thought I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, well, you probably are re relieved when you, when you begin expressing appreciation or when you get appreciation. I mean, how, how good does it feel to have someone say thank you and to very specifically say thank you for what you did, the behavior? Right. The behavior, not not the result, I, which I yeah, saw. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Which which one do you think companies struggle with the most when you're doing yes. working with them? <laughs> you're like. Yes, 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 all of them. <laughs> all of them, yes. <laughs> I, I think there's a myopic focus by companies. There has been on the achieve core practice, and they want to go right to achieve. You know, let's get some results. And yet they still want to bring the same methodologies to trying to get those results. And that's just not going to work as the great redefinition uh, continues to, to blossom. Mm -hmm. Um Again, my friend Jody Thompson, uh, you can please go to go row, G O R O W E dot com and check out her website. Um, we, and she talks a lot about this. We are still measuring the wrong metrics. We're measuring how many hours somebody works. We're, uh, we, we're consumed today with where their butts in a chair. Um, man, it's just, when the, you know that company that delivers those pasteboard boxes to your front porch uh, daily around my house? Or, oh, yeah. <laughs> nice big envelope. I mean, the CEO there said recently, you know, if if you don't want to come into the office at least three days a week, you, you, you're not going to work here. So, you know, how, that's just measuring. That, that's a metric that um, when we were, uh, Henry Ford was inventing the assembly line methodology. That was important because you had to be there to twist a, a nut on a bolt. It's not important anymore. You can do most of the work from anywhere. So we just need to measure the right things. So when you have that myopic focus on the achieve results without understanding that perceive, conceive, and believe get you there, then that's when you start getting multiple flat tires on your truck. What would you say to a, a leader? It could be a young person, somebody who's maybe just entering the workforce, or maybe they've been in it for some time and they want to mm -hmm. excel in their career, but they don't have a company 
that really has bought into what you and I believe in so much, which is developing mm-hmm. people. And if, if you really want to grow, then you have to take care of the people that are helping you to build. But what would you say to someone who, who maybe doesn't have that kind of support to, to take them through those five core practices? Is there anything that you think could help somebody? Could they do this on their own without mm-hmm. their necessarily? Well, that, that's great. My publishing journey has has morphed in the last probably 12 months. I say it's morphed. Back in 01, when my first book came out, it was a short book, about 120 pages. I've returned to short books. And and here's the reason why I think people are more uh, neurodiverse in their reading habits. That's what I'm supposed to say instead of ADHD now. <laughs> <laughs> They're more neurodiverse in their reading habits, so they want short books. Okay. So all the books that I'm going to write for the next mm, probably five, six years are going to be short books, less than 100 pages. So I've written two recently that address this very thing because, you know, the easy answer is, oh, go find another job somewhere. That that ain't so easy today. The number, you know, we're we're living in a weird place between companies saying, I, I don't know how to attract top talent. I don't know how to find people who want to work. And then young people like the ones that you're describing who want to work, you know. Want to be successful, though. That's why they're the- Yeah. So the the last two books, depending on when this comes out, uh, Small Hinges Swing Big Doors, as you mentioned earlier, is a bestseller. That uh, book is based on this very question. How do I begin to create a work positive culture right where I am? There are 51 what I call culture dots and dot stands for do one thing. There are 51 culture dots right there that you can. I mean, again, if you just read one dot a day, it'd probably take you five minutes, four minutes, something like that, and just begin practicing those dots. Mm -hmm. Um, My next book that's soon to come out, it'll come out before Christmas of 23. uh, So you should be able to find any, find both these on Amazon or wherever you buy fine books. Um, (laughs) But everybody seems to go to Amazon, right? (laughs) (laughs) Well, we do for now. We'll see how the company is in 10 years. Um, but, uh, do one thing is the name of this second short book. And that's got a big dot on the cover. It's really cool. I got a great cover designer. Um, and that is 15 work positive experts that I've interviewed for my podcast, work positive podcast. And I, uh, ask each of them, what's one thing work positive nation can do today to begin to create a positive work culture. And so I share that one thing. I give you the link to watch it on YouTube. It's a short. And then I interpret that. You know, here's what you can do today and then give you a a question or an activity, some kind of action item. And you go right into our website, into the dot community. And so you can hook up with other people who are trying to do the same thing and meet up with them and learn from them. So peer to peer learning can take place in in a fine fashion. So. That's because I get this question so often. Small hinges really do swing big doors. And we you can do one thing right where you are to begin creating the kind of work culture that you want to be a part of. Yes, absolutely. And that goes along with so much that I I learned from Zig. And you know, what is a top performer? A top performer doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean that your environment changes, your boss changes, anything, you know, your external doesn't matter as much as what are you going to do about it. And so Mm. if you're if you aren't fortunate enough to have a company that's investing in you and your your training and development, go out, be that top performer and find it for yourself by reading, you know, small hinges, swing big doors and the culture dots, which I love. Do one thing. Mm, Yeah, thanks. Well, and Jim Palmer, who introduced us, is really fond of talking about if you wait for the best season to come around, it's just not going to happen. So you can what if yourself. right into a a 30 year career of misery and life's too short to do that so oh boy the older i get the shorter it gets (laughs) i I always was right (laughs) i'm amazed at how fast this show goes but we uh wrap up here but if what's what's one last thing for somebody who's listening whether they work for a company or maybe they have their own company you've learned so much about how to you know transform culture internally and externally if one piece of advice you would share wow Uh, the very thing that we were just talking about and that is um, empower yourself 
um, regardless of the circumstances around you. If you if you wait for the economy to get better, if you wait for your boss to figure out how to lead you, um, it, th these times will never come. But just find one thing you can do today. And, and again, that's why I read Small Hinges Swing Big Doors book. That's why the Do One Thing book is out there. Um, at the risk of sounding like a shameless plug for those two books, I, I really don't make that much off of them, I promise. But, <laughs> but they're valuable will, content. They are very valuable content, and they will get you started. And once you start, of course, you burn 90% of your fuel escaping gravity, right? But once you get started, you'll be amazed at how the people around you will be attracted to you because they'll see, hey, Michelle's doing something different here. It's positive. I like being around her. She's getting better results. How can I hang out more with Michelle and, and get some work done? Dr. Joey, thank you so much for being on the show. This has been a treasure, and I'm so happy to have reconnected with you. Every moment I get to spend with you is magical. Thank you, Michelle. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And I know that my mom listens to most all of these podcasts that I'm on, so, so we'll have at least one listener. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. All right. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Joey. And that is it for the Power of Authority Spotlight. And I always like to just pull it all together because, uh, you know, Dr. Joey gave us some incredible insights. Do one thing that is as simple as it gets. But I do love the five core practices, starting with perceive, you know, focusing on the mental, mentally perceiving, conceiving, right? Socially, the relationships, internal and external, um, being aware of those. Uh, believing the emotional side of things, engagement, all of those pieces of that puzzle all have to happen before you can do what most people start at, which is achieve. We all want to achieve. That's the physical action that you have to take, the strategic action, the behavior, but you have to do those first things uh, first. And then once you achieve, then it is the receiving and the gratitude and 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 just you know serving other people. There is no greater gift um, Zig would always say you can have everything in life you want if you just help enough other people get what they want. That's right. All people want to be great, uh, you know, be, be, they want to be thanked for what they do. So yes. we're out of time, but we'll see you next time on the Power of Authority Spotlight. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much for listening to the Power of Authority Spotlight. If you are a successful founder, entrepreneur, business owner, or leader that's getting results and making a difference, and you'd like to be on this program, please visit performancepublishinggroup.com forward slash podcast to apply. That's performancepublishinggroup.com forward slash podcast. Also, if you got something out of this interview, please share this episode. Just do a quick screenshot with your phone and text it to a friend or post it on the socials. If you know someone that would be a great guest, tag them on social media to let them know about the show and include the hashtag, the power of authority spotlight. I love seeing your posts and guest suggestions. We are regularly putting out new episodes and content, so make sure you don't miss any episodes by subscribing. Your thumbs up, ratings, and reviews go a long way to help promote the show and mean a lot to me and my team. Want to know more? Go to our websites, performancepublishinggroup.com or michelleprince.com and follow me on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. Thanks so much for listening and we'll see you next time.